Very good. Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Brown. I work on the, uh, the Grails development team at, uh, at OCI. And uh, what I'm going to be talking about uh, this, this afternoon is um, uh, we're going to be taking a look a, a little bit under the hood of, of how uh, some specific features inside of Grails works. Um, so Soren approached me uh, a couple weeks ago and said, uh, hey, can you do a talk uh, called Grails Under the Hood? And that's all we were, that's what we were starting with. And I said, uh, Under the Hood of Grails is something that I know about. Uh, so I've been working uh, pretty much full time on the Grails framework for uh, uh, eight years or so, seven, eight years, something like that. Uh, so certainly that's something I know about. We, I can uh, come up with uh, some interesting things to talk about. And when I started trying to put together a plan for uh, what to do, I, there are lots of, lots of pieces of the framework that I'd, that I'd love to spend time talking about. Uh, part of the challenge there is we could set up a whole day event to do that. Um, so we don't have a whole day event, we've got about 50 minutes. Um, so, so what I've done is I've taken a couple of um, kind of general features of the Groovy programming language that Grails uses specifically for a number of things, but uh, that, that Grails uses specifically and I'm going to talk about those language features a little bit and uh, talk about how they relate to Grails. And then we're going to jump into, uh, jump into an IDE and write some real code that, that kind of simulates some things that are going on inside the framework. And as part of that process, uh, hopefully uh, several things will come out of that. One is uh, hopefully you'll learn some interesting and kind of fun things that the language is capable of. And also, uh, while doing that, that'll help kind of demystify a little bit about um, some of the magic that's going on inside the framework. There's, we'll just get a sense for, or you'll see how some of, that, uh, some of that magic really happens. And understanding how some of the magic happens inside the framework is, uh, is useful, even if you don't have to drill down into that layer and start, start tinkering with knobs down there. Just understanding how the framework does some of the, some of the really cool things it does, um, I, I think is, is beneficial from, uh, from an application developer's perspective, even if you're not gonna get into the, uh, the, the source code for the framework itself. So let's just, uh, let's jump right into it. Um, so our goals, uh, as I said, I'm going to uh, uh, discuss uh, a specific language feature, then we'll talk about how Grails takes advantage of that language feature, and then we'll write some code that uh, exercises uh, that, that feature that we just discussed, and then we'll repeat that process. Uh, we'll go through a couple of iterations of that. And uh, the more interactive we can make this, uh, the better it will be. So certainly speak up, uh, raise your hands, get my attention. If you've got any questions or comments as we're moving along, uh, please, please speak up. And I'll be happy to field that. And if it makes sense to send things kind of in a different direction uh, based on your question, we can do that. And if it makes sense to, to, to uh, maybe address the, the question offline later, we can do that. But in any case, uh, if you've got comments or questions, please speak up. Um, don't feel like you need to wait until the end to... Uh, uh, to make this a discussion. All right. uh, so some of the features that I'm going to talk about relate to uh, metaprogramming in particular. Metaprogramming is a really, really powerful part of uh, dynamic, languages, dynamic languages, and in particular, metaprogramming, Gro Groovy supports uh, metaprogramming really, really well. There's some really cool stuff that Groovy's uh, metaprogramming system allows you to do that are either uh, really difficult or maybe just plain impossible to do in uh, some other programming languages. So I, I want to drill in on, on kind of groovy specific stuff that, uh, that Grails takes advantage of that we really, really wouldn't be able to do or wouldn't be able to do in the same way or maybe wouldn't be able to do as easily if uh, the framework were built with, with some other programming language. So metaprogramming, um, in short, is, uh, is the, relates to this idea of programs that modify programs. So in Groovy, while your program's running, your program can modify itself, right? Your program can be adding methods to classes or replacing existing methods. Uh, while your program's running, the code can be changing the, itself, changing that program uh, at runtime. That opens up all kinds of really cool, interesting possibilities. That's, uh, that's runtime metaprogramming. That's while your program's running, this stuff is happening. Uh, another kind of metaprogramming that Groovy supports is compile time metaprogramming. Um, so it turns out that Groovy makes it fairly easy to write code that participates in the compilation process, right? So uh, the compiler, in short, what the compiler's doing is it reads your, your source files, right? Your source files are just plain text stuff that uh, the compiler reads. And the compiler has to make sense of that. All the source code that you've, you've put in your .groovy files, the compiler has to, has to make sense of that. So one of the things that the compiler has to do is parse 
your class definitions, parse your source files, and then create a representation in memory that, that uh, create a model in memory that represents what you've described in your source code. Um, and that's all working towards the goal of eventually writing a .class file, right? So we're reading a .groovy file and writing a .class file. In order to do that, the compiler has to, has to parse your source code, create some kind of model that represents that, and then do some stuff with the model, and then write, uh, uh, serialize that into a .class file. Uh, Groovy's, uh, as I said before, Groovy makes it pretty easy for you to write code that participates in that process. This model that the compiler builds up in memory, that's a representation of, of what you've expressed in your source code, is, is uh, known as an abstract syntax tree. That's what AST stands for, an abstract syntax tree. So the way that, uh, a, a way to do compile time metaprogramming in Groovy is to write what are called AST transformations. So an a, if you understand what an AST is, the abstract syntax tree is a representation of, of your code uh, in memory. An AST transformation is what the name suggests. It's a thing that trans, transforms. It's a transformation that gets applied to that model. So imagine that the compiler has read your source files and realized, okay, you, you've defined a class called book, and in the book class are properties like publisher and author and number of pages and so forth. So the compiler has to build a model in memory that, that corresponds to that. An AST transformation can kind of look at that model and interact with it and do things like remove a property or rename a property or add a new property or add a new method. Um, an AST transformation can do at compile time pretty much anything that you could express in source code, right? So you can define a method in source code and put code inside that method. Uh, you can also do that at compile time with an AST transformation. So in AST, the abstract syntax tree is this model in memory that is a, a representation of what you've expressed in your source code, and an AST transformation is something that transforms that model. So those are the two, uh, and that's, that's really a 30,000-foot level. Metaprogramming is, is something, I, I love to talk about metaprogramming. I think it's, it's probably the most exciting, uh, compelling feature of the, of the language. Metaprogramming is, is something we could talk about for a couple of days. What I've just described is just really a, a really high-level, quick summary, uh, just enough to, to kind of support what I want to drill into today. So there are two kinds of metaprogramming, runtime metaprogramming and compile-time metaprogramming. Uh, Compile-time metaprogramming is generally done in the form of uh, AST transformations. Uh, so Grail supplies uh, lots of compile time tra transformations to uh, application artifacts. Uh, there's a bunch of interesting th stuff that happens to your controller action methods. So in, in, in Grails, uh, when you, there's an artifact type known as a controller, and in that controller, all of your public methods get turned into controller actions. And uh, we're going we're gonna to look at uh, a lot of the details here and get an idea of a lot of the stuff that Grails is doing at compile time to all of your controller actions to provide useful functionality that, that simplifies the code that you have to write. Uh, so this list is just a, a, li a, a, a tiny subset of some of the things that Grails manages uh, with uh, compile, time AS compile time transformations or AST transformations. So first, I want to talk about uh, runtime metaprogramming. And I want to go through the, the runtime metaprogramming stuff pretty quickly because the compile time stuff is, uh, uh, is, is a little bit more in-depth and, and there's more to talk about there. But I want to quickly demonstrate a couple of things that, that uh, you can do with um, uh, Groovy's runtime metaprogramming system. Specifically, I want to talk about uh, closures and their delegates and get a sense for what, the, what, those, what a delegate is as it relates to a closure, and then talk about how some of that relates to um, how, how Grails takes advantage of, of these ideas. So Groovy, since the very beginning, has had support for closures, right? A closure is a block of code. Uh, it's an object like any other object. You can pass that block of code as an argument to a method call, uh, for example. A method call could return a closure, so you're returning a block of code now. A closure is a block of code. Every closure in Groovy has a delegate associated with it. So if you've, uh, the closure, closure class has a property called delegate. And that delegate gets an opportunity to respond to method calls that are made when the closure is executed. And we'll look at examples and, and uh, really drill into what that means. But while your closure is executing, there's code inside the closure. That code could be invoking methods. And the closure gets an opportunity to respond to those method calls. So it turns out that's really useful for creating uh, dynamic DSLs with Groovy. And when you do that, you can end up 
with the same block of code, this, this closure you've defined someplace in your application, that same block of code can be executed in different contexts and depending on the delegate, that block of code could, uh, could yield fundamentally different behavior. All right? So if, th if that doesn't make perfect sense, stand by and, and hopefully some examples will, will help clear some of this up. So here's some code that uh, creates a closure and in the closure we're invoking a method called append and passing uh, the string grails as an argument and then calling append again and passing the string by object computing ink. And if I were to execute that closure, uh, does anyone know what, what would happen if I were to paste that code into uh, an editor and run that code as groovy code? Sort. Yeah, we'd get a, a, a missing method exception. Um, because append is not a keyword, it's nothing magic in Groovy, the append doesn't really mean anything in Groovy. Uh, we're just invoking a method there called append, and there is no such method. So uh, if I were to run that code, we'd get an exception that looks something like that. We'd get a Groovy lang missing method exception, no signature of method, do it dot append. Uh, so this code was actually inside of a script called do it dot Groovy, that's where the do it comes from. But whatever class you were in, you would see that class name there. Um, so that code is, is uh, as, as written right now, isn't very useful. Like it doesn't, doesn't do anything productive and it, it can't be executed without throwing an exception. Remember that those, those method calls are happening inside of a closure. We've declared a closure and put these calls to append inside the closure. Remember that every closure has a delegate associated with it and that delegate gets an opportunity to respond to method calls that are made inside the closure. So the delegate we can assign a delegate to this closure that knows how to respond to the append method. So, so one example of how we might do that is something like this. So we've got the same code except uh, there in the middle, I'm creating a string buffer and uh, assigning that string buffer to be the delegate of this closure. So my closure is a reference that points to the closure and that closure has a delegate, all closures have a delegate and here I'm assigning the value of that delegate to be the string buffer before executing the closure. It's important that that happen before you execute the closure. When the closure executes, that first line of code inside the closure is a call to append and we're passing a string argument. Normally what will happen when, um, when a closure like that is executed is we'll get a missing method exception, right? That, that first line of code inside the closure is a call out to the Groovy runtime system that says, hey, I want to invoke a method named append and I want to pass this string as an argument, the string grails. And what the grails, uh, I'm sorry, what Groovy's method dispatch mechanism is going to do with that is it's going to try to find the append method. If, if, so if this code were in a class, uh, it would try to find the append method in that class. And if the append method's there, it, it will be executed. And if it's not there, Groovy will throw a missing method exception that says, hey, you've tried to call a method that doesn't exist. But there's a step that I just skipped over in that, in that uh, scenario is before throwing the missing method exception, Groovy will check the closure's delegate and ask it if it could respond to this method call. So Groovy effectively is going to ask the string buffer class, well, well first it's going to recognize that we called the append method. It's going to look around in this class and see there is no append method. And so Groovy's all revved up now to throw a missing method exception. But before it throws a missing method exception, it's going to make one more attempt. And that attempt is, is something like Groovy will look at the closure's delegate and recognize what type of object it is. So it's a string buffer. So Groovy will ask the string buffer class, hey, if somebody were to invoke the uh, method named append and pass a string as an argument, could you respond to that method call? And the string buffer class can respond to that method call, right? There's an append method in the string buffer class that will accept a string as a parameter. So instead of throwing an exception, Groovy will let the delegate respond to the method call. So if we ran this program, we would see the output is buffer grails by object computing ink. So those calls to append up there at the top uh, really ended up being calls to the append method on a string buffer that didn't even exist when the closure was created. This, the code you see is, is written, is executed in the order that you see there. So the closure is defined then the string buffer is created and assigned to be the delegate of the closure and then the closure is invoked. So those lines of code up at the top, those calls to append, are at runtime, the way this is written right now, will end up interacting with a string buffer which the closure doesn't know anything about, right? It didn't even exist when the closure was created, but that will work. 
so how does that um, bias or how does that help us build uh, dynamic DSLs is, uh, is a good question. So in this case, what we've done is we've assigned the delegate to be a string buffer. And the string buffer knows what append means. It, it, uh, all Java developers know what the append method in the string buffer class does. So in this context, where this, the code that we're looking at now, when this runs, calling append inside the closure means one thing. It means uh, we're putting some stuff in a string buffer, right? Uh, that exact same closure, the closure there at the top uh, that calls append and so forth, could be executed in a different context where the delegate is not a string buffer, but it's something that knows how to write to standard out. So instead of uh, uh, appending to a string buffer, those calls to append might be um, sending strings to standard out. Or maybe we've got uh, a different delegate that uh, pops up dialogues in a GUI application when you call append or whatever. But in, is, the idea is that as the author of the closure, I just need to know that, it's, that there's an append method and that that's a valid thing to do in, in this context. And then what, how that's actually carried out at runtime depends on what delegate has been assigned to that, to that closure before the closure is executed. So how does that relate to Grails? There are all, all over the place in Grails, we have, um, we have DSLs for, for lots of things. Uh, one example of that is in a Grails domain class, you can declare this constraints property, a static constraints property, and assign, uh, assign that property a, a value that is a closure. And inside of that closure, that's really a DSL. It's a, it's, the domain is constraints, right? It's a, it's a language for describing what are valid values for these properties. So we've expressed that the first name and last name each have to have at least five characters, they can have no more than 50 characters. They can't be blank. The age has to be uh, in the range of 21 to 99, and the email address has to, has to be a, a, a valid email address, or at least look like a valid email address. So we've got a DSL there for describing what are valid values in, a, in this particular, in, for instances of this particular d domain class. So syntactically, what's going on there, that first line of code in the constraints block, um, syntactically, what is that? How does Groovy interpret that line of code? That's a, method call. That's a method call, right? So we're invoking a method named first name, and how many arguments are being passed to the method call? Two. Right, so it's one, right? We're passing a map. Uh, so a map is being passed as an argument to each of these, actually, uh, to the first name method, the last name method, the age, and the email. Um, so all four of those, all of the, the four names, first name, last name, age, and email, those are the names of methods that we're invoking, and we're passing a map as an argument, and something is intercepting those method calls, right? There's no first name method in this class. There's no last name method. Uh, so if you wrote a class like this and then grabbed this closure and just executed it, you'd get missing method exceptions because there is no first name method. There is no last name method. Groovy has, uh, Groovy's method dispatch mechanism is really, really flexible. There's all kinds of cool stuff you can do to participate in Groovy's method dispatch. And one of the pieces of that is that um, you can write a class that has a method in it called method missing. And uh, it has to have a certain signature. It returns object. It accepts a string and an array of objects. But you define a method called method missing in a class. And now if you create an instance of that class, you can invoke any method at all. Just make up a method name and invoke it on an instance of that class. And instead of getting a missing method exception, that myth missing method, I'm sorry, that method missing method will be invoked. So you've written a class with a method called method missing. You create an instance of it and just invoke methods that don't exist. What Groovy will do with that is it will invoke the method missing method in that class and pass in some arguments that tells the method uh, missing method what the name of the method is that you invoked and what arguments did you pass. So if we wrote a class that had a method missing method in it and set that to be the delegate of this closure before this closure gets executed, then that call to first name would actually be invoking the method missing method in that delegate. And the same with last name and age and email. So it turns out how this works inside the framework is Grails is uh, Iterating over all of your domain classes at application startup, and there's a bunch of stuff we have to do to all of your domain classes at startup. And one of the things that the framework does with your domain classes is it looks inside each of them to see if this constraints property is there. And if it is, uh, the framework will grab the value of, this, of the property, grab this closure, and execute it. 
But if that's all the framework did, we'd get missing method exceptions. So before executing it, the framework creates an instance of some class whose name you don't care about. And that instance that's created is set to be the delegate on this closure before the delegate is executed. That class has a method missing method in it. So when you call first name and pass this map argument, method missing is invoked. That method missing will look at the method name. So you invoke the method name first name. It will come back to this domain class and say, is there a first name property in this domain class? And there is. So then uh, the, uh, the delegate will look at the map parameter. Um, so we see there's a size uh, entry in the map and a blank entry in the map. And this delegate knows what those things mean, right? There's a, a part of Grails that knows what size mean and knows what blank means and those affect the DDL that uh, will be generated for your relational database and they affect validation when you create a person and call that validate on it. Where these rules are imposed every time you call uh, uh, save or validate on an instance of the person class. So the delegate that, that's applied to this closure at runtime in your application does all that that I just described. Uh, what I'm about to describe doesn't exist, but it would be easy to build something like this. So we could build a Grails plugin that does the same kind of thing, that just iterates over all of your domain classes and finds these constraints properties. And, but that plugin would, could set a different delegate on this closure before executing it. And what that delegate could do is intercept these method calls and maybe generate an HTML report that says, you've got a domain class called person, these are all the properties, and these are the constraints that are defined for those properties, right? So in that context, that call to first name means one thing, right? It means maybe a, a new table row is put in an HTML table or something, right? Um, but that exact same line of code can be executed in a different context, like your Grails runtime, and that call to first name means, you know, construct a database table with certain, or database column with certain uh, width attributes and so forth. Um, so that exact same code could be executed in different contexts with different results, and it's the delegate that's assigned to the closure that gets to decide what, what does it really mean to call age and pass range 2199 as an argument. So all that makes sense? Cool stuff. Uh, let's see. I'm going to forego this first coding session and, and get, introduce some more ideas, and then we're going to jump into the IDE. I want to make sure we don't, uh, don't run out of time uh, before getting through the, the stuff that I really want to talk about. All right. Um, so that's runtime metaprogramming. That's all happening at runtime. There was no compiler aspect to, uh, to any of that. Let's jump into the context of a Grails application. And you've got a, uh, this update method would be inside of a Grails controller. We're inside of a Grails controller, and we've got an action that accepts a person object as an argument. And uh, the first thing, this, what this method is going to do is it's going to update the database, right? So we've, you've passed a person as an argument here, and we're going to update the database to uh, reflect whatever values are currently in that person instance. So I'm going to talk more about how that person instance gets populated and so forth in just a minute. For now, what I want to focus on is we've got a controller action that's going to modify the database. And something you never want to do, of course, is modify the database in response to a get request, as an example. That's a really bad idea. What, if you had a, con a, a controller action that deleted things from the database, and there's some URL that leads to that action, what if Google, Google were to cache that URL? Somebody does a search, and your URL is there, they click the link, and you're doing destructive stuff in your app, right? You're, you're modifying your database just because somebody clicked on a, a Google link. That's a bad idea, right? So... Uh, there's, there's imperative logic here in this controller action that says if the request method is not a put, if it's not a put request, then send a 405 back. That's the HTTP response code for um, method not allowed, I think. Uh, so this action may only be ex is only accessible via a put request. That's our rule. So we've got imperative logic here that imposes that rule. Uh, so if this action is executed with a put, the else block will execute. Otherwise, we'll send a 405. Uh, so you don't need to do that. You don't have to write that code. You want to impose those rules, right? You don't want to do destructive stuff in w with uh, a get request as an example. But you don't have to write that Im imperative logic. Uh, if you did, that would be bad, right? Th that sort of thing would show up in lots of places all over the application. So instead of you having to write that, um, the framework provides a mechanism for you to express those rules declaratively instead of imperatively.
So uh, in, inside of your controller, you can declare this static property called allowed methods and assign it a map. The keys in this map correspond to action names in your controller, right? So we see there's an update action in this controller. That's the code you see above. Uh, the value associated with update in our map down there at the bottom is the word put. And that means that the update action is only accessible via a put request. And if any other kind of HTTP request tries to invoke the update action, so a get, a post, a head, a trace, anything other than a put, uh, a 405 will be generated. You don't have to write any code to make that happen other than define the allowed methods property. So you've declaratively expressed the rules and said that the save action is only accessible via a post and update is only a, uh, accessible via put. You declaratively express that and then the framework will take care of, uh, of imposing those rules, right? Does that make sense? So the way that's happening is there is a compile time transformation. There's an AST transformation that's inside the framework that goes through all of your controller actions and uh, for every action in your controller, uh, so, so when the compiler comes across this update action, it will go to see if there's an allowed methods property in this class. And if there's not, then we just carry on. There's nothing to do here. If there is an allowed methods property in this class, then uh, the compiler will look inside of that map to see if update is represented there. And if it is, the compiler generates the code that you see in the upper left. It generates the code that says, if this request method is not a put, throw a four, or return of, of 405, right? So that imperative logic is actually in your bytecode, uh, but it's put there by the compiler or the, everything in your bytecode is put there by the compiler, right? But it's, it's not, um, in earlier versions of Grails, that all had to be sorted out kind of at runtime. And the, the way it worked is, but because we couldn't put code inside of your controller, with uh, AST transformations didn't exist in earlier versions of Groovy. So we couldn't generate this code to put right inside of your controller. So there was a thing upstream, uh, I think it was in a filter, but some code that got executed before your controller actions got executed, that code was dynamically inspecting your controller and looking to see if the allowed methods property was there and doing all this stuff. One of the comp complications or limitations of that approach is in your unit testing environment, if you created an instance of this controller and invoke the update action, that code that's in the filter doesn't get applied, right? So it, it made it difficult to test um, uh, the allowed method stuff, right? So now that that stuff's compiled right, into, right inside of your controller action methods, you can just create an instance of your controller and invoke the method and uh, the, the allowed method handling is there. It's as if you wrote the code yourself in the source code. Uh, some other things related to that are how uh, Grails handles uh, command objects. So if you declare, a con again, we're in a controller here. These are both uh, controller actions. If you write a controller action like you see at the top there, so you write a controller action that accepts a widget as an argument, uh, the compiler is gonna generate a method that looks like the code at the bottom. So you never write the code at the bottom. That, that's being generated for you. Effectively, that's being generated for you. And what that code is doing is creating an, an instance of the widget class uh, imposing that widget to, or subjecting that, that widget to data binding, right? So we're gonna bind the request parameters to that widget object. So if the widget class has a property called width and height, or properties called width and height, uh, and there are request parameters called width and height, those request parameter values will be bound to the corresponding properties in the widget class, right? So a widget is created, it's subjected to data binding, uh, then it's subjected to dependency injection, so um, your command object classes uh, can have uh, references to beans that come from the Spring application context. So data binding happens, dependency injection happens, then the object is validated, and then the last thing that happens there is uh, notice that we're calling the method that you wrote. Remember that you wrote the method that accepts a widget parameter, and we generate the noarg version of this same method, some controller action, and what that method does is what you see here, and then passes the widget into the code that you wrote. So the framework never actually invokes your controller action. The code that you wrote at the top there, we're never invoking that method. We're invoking the noarg method that was generated at compile time, and it ends up invoking the method that you wrote. Right. Questions about any of that so far? All right.
If that command object were a domain class, so we'll say the person class in this example is a domain class, then uh, some additional things are going to happen. So you wrote the code that's represented at the top, and the code at the bottom is what the, gen the compiler generates. And it's a little pseudo codey, but it's uh, close enough that it, this describes what, what's really going on. Uh, so the compiler will generate a no argument version of some controller action, and instead of just creating a person object, it might be that uh, instead of creating a person that we want to retrieve a person from the database. So the, one of the first things the, code, the generated code is going to do is it's going to look to see if there's a request parameter called id, if params.id. And if there is, then we're going to use that request parameter as an argument to person.get to go retrieve an instance of the person from the database. Um, and if there is no id request parameter and this is a post request, then we'll just create a brand new person. So if it's not a post request, we won't create a brand new person. So P will still be null at that point. So if ID is there, we'll use that to uh, go do a database lookup. And if it's not there, then we'll create a new person if this is a post request. Um, next, we need to figure out if this thing should be subjected to data binding. So we'll start with the idea that it will be subjected to data binding. Def do binding equals true. Um, so we check to see if there is a request parameter called ID. And if there is, and this is not a patch, post, or put request, then we're going to turn off data binding. Do binding equals false. Um, so once we figured out if uh, we should subject the thing to data binding, we fall down to where it says if do data binding. If da do data binding or do binding is true, then we'll call bind data to do the data binding, and then do dependency injection, then validate the thing, and then invoke your action. Right. So. Um, this is, a, this is a common thing, right? Folks write controller actions all the time that accept a domain object as an argument. And uh, maybe you just know that if you send a request parameter whose name is ID, that before your code is ever executed, PER will point to the object in the database whose ID is that value, right? The value of the ID request parameter. Um, but maybe you had no reason to think about how that happened. But what I just described uh, summarizes how that happens. Right, so there's a compile time transformation that's making all that happen. So what I want to do is jump into the IDE and get uh, a little bit of, we're going to build a really, really simple example of this, but uh, hopefully this simple example will give you a sense for um, what uh, compile time AST transformations look like. Before I start writing code and running code, um, any questions or comments about anything I've discussed so far? That's good. All right, very good. Um, so we're going to start with this, right? So I've got a, a unit test here that uh, if I run this, uh, it should pass. We've got a green bar there. Um, so there's, there's really nothing interesting happening yet. We've just got, an we've got a starting point to, to do some interesting things. So I've got a widget class with a method in it called double some number, and you pass in a number, and what you're going to get back is that number doubled, right? So and, I, and I've got a unit test that describes that that does what, it's, uh, what it should do. Um, so let's, uh, let's introduce a new requirement here that says if I were to invoke the no argument version of that method, um, we, need, we get to make an assertion about what should, uh, what should come back. So I'm going to say that if you invoke double sum number and you don't pass an argument that we expect the number 84 back, just some number, right? If I run this test, uh, this should not work, right? We get a missing method exception, no signature of method, double sum number is applicable for arguments, empty, an empty argument list, right? We're invoking a method that doesn't exist. And what I want to do is write an AST transformation that will be applied to this class when this class is compiled. And what that transformation is going to do is something similar to what we talked about back here. Uh, back here. And that is right there. Um, so we're going to generate a no argument version of the method that comes up with some value that can be passed into the version of the method that you wrote, right? So you wrote some controller action that accepts a widget. The compiler generates the no argument version of that method that will call your method. We're going to do the same sort of thing here. So we want it to be as if you had done this. So we'll say double sum number 42 is the magic number. We'll run that, 
This should, should allow our test to pass, but it's not the solution that we want. But it represents the behavior that we want, right? But we don't want this. We're going to get rid of that code there and get our test back in a failing state. All right. So I've got a magic default annotation. And bear with me. I'm going to do a, a little bit of hand-waving over a couple of the details until we get enough pieces of the puzzle on the table to clarify some of this. So uh, bear with me briefly. So we've got an, uh, an annotation called magic default. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to annotate this method with magic default. And what that means is I want the magic default behavior added to this method. I want this default value of 42 to come from someplace. Right? So if I invoke the double sum num number method and don't pass any arguments, somehow I want this to default to 42, like that. Right? All right, so I've annotated this uh, method with uh, magic default. If I run the test again, nothing interesting has changed. That annotation doesn't do anything yet. Um, but uh, we can make this annotation more meaningful with something like this. Uh, except I have to spell groovy correctly. Groovy AST, what have I got? Uh, there it is. There we go. All right. So I've annotated the magic default annotation with groovy AST transformation class. And we'll call this demo.magic default transformation. So what that means is anytime a method is annotated with magic default, anytime a method is annotated with magic default, like this right here, I want this AST transformation to be applied. Right? So we're going to write that AST transformation. Right now, that AST transformation doesn't do anything interesting. I've got the class here, uh, but it's, it's mostly empty. So I've written a class that implements the AST transformation interface. Uh, the interface defines this method. So what the Groovy compiler is going to do now when it compiles this class is it's going to recognize that this method is annotated with magic default. It's also going to recognize that magic default is written such that any method that's annotated with magic default should have uh, this transformation applied to it. And we're going to put some code inside of this transformation that yields the behavior that, uh, uh, that we want. Uh, so let's do that. So we'll say def uh, method node equals node sub one. So node sub so nodes is this array of AST nodes that's passed into your visit method. The first element in that array is going to be the annotation, the magic number node, uh, which is not what we want. We're, um, it, it could be the case that we wanted to get a reference to this annotation. If the annotation had uh, attributes like uh, value equals nine, time, whatever. It had some attributes like that, and we wanted to access those attribute values in our transformation, we could do that because we've got a reference to the magic default um, uh, AST node. Uh, but we don't need access to that in this case. So I'm going to skip the first element. Uh, so node sub zero is there. It's just not anything we're interested in. So the second element in this array is going to be the method node. So remember that I said that the compiler reads your source code and creates a model in memory that corresponds to what you've expressed in your source code. That model is, is really a bunch of these AST nodes. And there are lots of types of AST nodes. There's a method node. There's a, um, a class node, a field node. Uh, and there, there are nodes that represent pretty much anything that you can express in Groovy, classes, fields, methods, and lots more. So node sub one in this case is going to be the method node. It's the node that corresponds to this method right here. So that I can interrogate that node and discover things like the method name, the parameters, the return type, the body. I, I can, I'll, I'll have a reference to the AST version, uh, or the AST representation of this method. All right. Let me get about uh, four or five lines of code in here. We'll get our test to pass and then... Uh, there's lots of details we can drill into. All right, so we want to know the method name. Uh, there's a property called name on, on the method node class. Um, what else do we need to know? Let's create a new method. Whose name is uh, the same as this method's name. Uh, the modifier, we're going to make it a public method. Um, the return type, 
for now, I'm just going to just hard code this. We're just going to, so our, our annotation is really only useful for methods that return an integer right now. I'm just going to hard code the return type to be an integer. Uh, the method does not accept any parameters. No. And code. All right, let me format this so you can see what's going on. All right, so what I'm doing there on uh, line 24 is I'm creating a new method node. Remember, we want to add a method to this class. The method that we're going to add is this no argument version of double sum number. We're creating a new method at compile time and adding it to this class. That's what we want to do. Uh, so on line 24, I'm creating a new method node. And the first argument is the name of the method. So it's going to be the same name as the method that was in the source code. Um, it's a public method. It returns an integer. Uh, it accepts zero parameters. If it accepted parameters, then I could create an array of these parameter objects, and the parameters have names and, and types and so forth. But this method accepts no parameters. That null, the second to the last uh, argument there, is an array of exception types that this method might throw, and we're not, uh, so, so it's as if we didn't have a throws clause in our method. So that's why that's null. And code, we haven't defined yet. Uh, that's what, that's going to be the instructions that actually go inside the method. We'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, let's see, the class equals method node dot declaring class. All right, yep, that's right. And the class dot add method, new method. So all that's missing so far is the code. Look on line 29, I'm referring to a variable called code that doesn't exist. We need to create that. Um, so uh, back from the top, on line 21, we're just getting a reference to the method node. On line 22, we're discovering the name of the method. 24 through 29, we're creating a whole new method object that uh, on line 32 gets added to whatever class declared this, right? So the class that has the method that was annotated with uh, at magic default. Uh, we're going to add our newly created method to that class. So the last bit we need here is the code. <coughs> And we're going to make this just super simple. Um, new method call expression. This. Um, we want a method name. And we want a new constant expression 42. All right. All right, let's uh, parse that and figure out what's going on. So an expression is, you can, in Groovy, there's lots of ways for you to uh, express an expression, right? This is an expression right here, right? Uh, this is an expression. Uh, th that's an expression. Um, so our AS teacher information is creating a new expression, and the type of expression we're creating is a new method call expression. Um, th so w it's as if we had written code like this this dot and then whatever method name is and we're passing as an argument 42 right so this dot some method name and we're passing an argument that's 42 and I've got the the argument value just hard-coded here to be the literal 42 um, what do I need this to be an expression state okay I think that will work. Let's get our project rebuilt and either see it work or debug why it's not working. What are we doing? I just want to run this. Let me open up a terminal while we're doing that. I'm going to run our test out here. I can just as well run it in here. I want to see. Okay, it did pass out there. Okay, so and it passed in here. Um, all right, so so this test is passing. Let's uh, see it fail once. So I'm going to assert that double sum number returns 82. It shouldn't. Right? It returned 84. So the assertion failed here. This is supposed to return 84. Run that. 
Okay, we're back to our green bar. So it's returning 84. Remember that uh, in our program we hard coded 42. So uh, that number is being passed as an argument to this method, and this method is doubling it, right? That's why we ended up with 84 instead of 42. But the idea here, again, if we try to relate this back to what's going on over here, is uh, so you wrote code that uh, includes this method that accepts some parameter. And there's a bunch of stuff that the framework can do before invoking that method to come up with a value to pass into your, to your method. In the transformation that I just wrote, it's, uh, it's really simple. We just have a hard-coded value, the number 42, where there's a bunch more logic here where we're creating an object and doing data binding. But the idea is the same, and that is we've got a rule that says under certain circumstances, I want to generate um, another version of this method at compile time and when I generate that method, I get to decide what that method's going to do. So instead of hard coding the number 42 here, we could have whatever elaborate logic we need uh, to come up with before invoking the, uh, the original method. But uh, that would just be more complexity. The, what I've demonstrated here covers all the moving pieces of this um, uh, at, the, at the level that, uh, that I think is, is useful at this point. Uh, so questions or comments about anything that's going on inside of this class? Uh, and I, I realize that uh, we've gone through some, some uh, pretty detailed stuff very, very quickly, uh, and I don't expect that you understand every detail of what's going on here, but hopefully you've got some sense for, um, uh, for what's going on in this transformation. But any specific questions about this code? Yes? Yeah, the, the question is, uh, can you pass a closure as an argument to this as well? And do, do you mean instead of the number 42? Or uh, you could. Um, so that would only make sense if this method accepted a closure parameter, right? Uh, you could do that. I've got another version of this. Yeah, you could do something like this. You can make the closure actually. Um, uh, an attribute of the annotation, and then inside of your AST transformation, we could refer to node sub zero, get a reference to that closure, and you know do whatever we want to do with that closure. Um, yeah, let me get this back into here. So I, I just uh, uh, sort of morphed this into a, a newer version, uh, a, a little bit more sophisticated version of, of what we just wrote. So notice that I've got uh, the same requirements I had before, and that is I can invoke double some number and I get back what I expect. If I invoke double some number with no argument, we get what we expect. And uh, so I've added another method called double some string that does the same kind of thing, right? It accepts a string and, and multiplies it. Um, so when I pass Jeff into that method, I expect to get back Jeff Jeff. And when I pass nothing into that method, I expect to get back 42, 42. That's just our rule, right? If you invoke the method and don't pass any arguments, um, what should happen is the string 42 should be passed to this method. That's, what, that's just our goofy requirement. That's what's supposed to happen. And this test asserts that is what happens. Let's go look at the code that makes that happen. And I'm going to focus just on the part that's, parts that, that changed here. So on line 20 there, we're doing the same sort of thing. We're retrieving the method node from that array of nodes that's passed into our visit method. On line 21, I'm getting the name of the method. On line 22, I'm creating an argument list expression. These are the arguments that are going to be passed to the method I'm going to call. Uh, and if the uh, parameter type, th this assumes that the method accepts one parameter. If the, if the method accepts a parameter of type integer, then the argument that I want to pass to the original method is going to be the number 42. And it, otherwise, the argument that I want to pass to the original method is the string 42, right? So I've got some conditional logic here. You can see how this is, gonna, this is starting to evolve to be more flexible and be more capable than the original version we wrote. Um, so, and then from here down, it's, it's mostly the same, right? So I'm creating a method call expression to call this dot, whatever method name is, and I'm passing... Uh, this thing as an argument. So that will either have the number 42 in it or the string 42, depending on which path we went down here. Uh, and then the rest is, is the same. So 
that satisfies this requirement. So we could continue to evolve this. We can make the thing more robust to deal with methods that accept uh, multiple parameters and maybe have, you know, have, have support for more than just integers and strings. But uh, again, that's, that's the moving pieces of this that I wanted to, uh, that I wanted to introduce. Comments, questions about any of that? Is that good? We have negative one minutes left. So uh, thank you all very much. And if I can help you with anything, uh, please let me know.